We are here today to celebrate FSG's um, 75th year and National Poetry Month. Um, we have Mitzi Angel and Jonathan Galassi, who are going to speak to the history of our poetry uh, in the past and in the present. Um, we will then be hearing from a wonderful group of poets. Um, one uh, bit of housekeeping is that um, we are going to have a Q&A portion at the, uh, towards the end. And uh, so please put your questions in chat. And also as this is an open environment, please remain respectful of our participants. And um, thank you again for being here today. Now I'm going to introduce Mitzi Angel, our publisher, and Jonathan Galassi, the president of FSG. Jonathan, you need to unmute. Hi, it's really great to have you here with us to help us celebrate 75 years of FSG and the ongoing uh, commitment that the house has always had to poetry. Uh, this is the 25th year of National Poetry Month, which actually was started in the FSG marketing meeting. Uh, we, and we collaborated then with the Academy of American Poets to get National Poetry Month going. And we think it's been a wonderful enhancement to the publishing and selling of poetry throughout the, the country. And uh, I, I hope the booksellers here will be able to testify that it's a way of making what's always been a happening part of the bookstore more focused and more uh, vivid during this special month. We love it and we're very grateful to you for everything you do to make it uh, so vibrant as a program. FSG was started in 1946 by Roger Strauss and John Farrer, but poetry at FSG really began uh, in 1955 when Bob Giroux was brought in by Roger from Harcourt Brace. Uh, he had had a very distinguished career as a literary editor. Uh, he was fed up with Harcourt Brace and he came over to, to uh, work with Roger whom he'd known in the war. And soon enough, along with him came his best friend from college, John Berryman, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bishop, and uh, some other great poets. And that was the beginning of the FSG poetry list. Bob's first book published at FSG was Homage to Mistress Bradstreet by John Berryman. That uh, it was a classic, has been a classic, was a prize winner. And that was how we got going. Uh, there have been generations of poets who followed uh, from that core, T.S. Eliot was another poet that came because of Bob to FSG in the very last years of his life. But that, that uh, also a very international group with Neruda and others. So the, the, the sort of range of FSG was started then, it's spread out over the years, it's, it's uh, become a much more capacious and we publish a lot more poetry now than we ever did at the beginning, but poetry as core to our values and to our, our publishing list started there with Bob and it's, it's remained core for us. And uh, it's been great fun. So now Mitzi, tell us a little bit about what we're publishing now and what we're going to be publishing. Yeah, so um, I um, joined FSG probably two and a half years ago, and um, I joined from Faber and Faber, where I was publisher. And of course, Faber and Faber is um, defined by its poetry list, much as FSG is. And um, 
poetry has been central to um, what I've done, not to the extent that Jonathan has, but um, to the extent that I feel it's at the heart of a publishing house. Um, and it's exciting to think about what we have coming up. Um, the cross-fertilization that took place between uh, Faber and FSG in the past in Bob Giroux's day continues to this day. So uh, when I was at Faber in the UK, we took on Aishan Hutchinson's House of Lords and Commons. And, um, and then I brought Hannah Sullivan over to the US from Faber. And Hannah, you'll hear from a bit later. Um, and so that's a little bit of my background. And um, I, I'm going to tell you a bit about what we have coming up. And interestingly, what we have coming up is actually um, in part uh, what we've already done, because a lot of the work we do is uh, reviving, uh, reimagining what was written in the past, keeping alive the voices we've published. So. Um, we have uh, Les Murray collected poems. We have new translation of Baudelaire. We have Adam Zagievsky's collected poems, Delmore Schwartz. And then we also have what surrounds the poetry, um, books, um, uh, books that come up, that come to our list um, because of the fact that we do publish poetry. So we have Aishan Hutchinson's essays, we have Derek Walcott essays, uh, we have biographies, uh, Audrey Lord biography, John Ashbury, James Schuyler, Elizabeth Bishop, we have journals, we have letters, and Jonathan works on all of this to keep the poetry um, present and uh, to emphasize its importance to our culture because the books that mattered then matter now. Um, and then on the horizon, um, on the not so distant horizon, we have new work. We have new work by Maureen McLean. We have Joseph Komanyaka, Frederick Seidel, Sean McRae. Um, and I thought it might be worth saying a, a few words about um, a line we have at FSG called FSG Originals. Uh, we published some books in paperback original, and we have a couple of poets that we're publishing at the moment in that format. Um, so it's a lower price point, and we have Roya Marsh, um, who is whose work is in the anthology. Uh, she's a poet, uh, a performer, an activist, an educator, and we have Chetla Sebri um, with field study. Um, and she's won the James Laughlin Award from the American of, of the Academy of American Poets. Um, so kind of in sum, I would say that forms have to change all the time and they change with the life around us. They change with the world around us and um, that poetry has to be contemporary and that there are lots of ways to be contemporary. And that, that's what you'll see in the poetry anthology, which we're publishing in November, and for which you'll see lots of programming, and I hope you'll participate in that. Um, so, you know, needless to say, books matter um, and have always mattered and may matter even more now. And I suppose I say that because of the pandemic and the isolation it's enforced on people. And I'm talking about the suffering in this nation and I think that poetry with its special intensities um, offers, a way, offers us a way out of that but it also also offers us a way in to that and that's what's very important about the form and that's what makes it um, central to what we do. Um, so um, that's, that gives you a bit of an overview, and um, I think we can move on to the next section and we can have a conversation with um, the poets. These I are four. I just wanted to say these are four of our uh, more recent 
acquisitions, additions to our list, and they are all, of course, featured in the FSG Poetry Anthology, which is coming out in November uh, as one of the keystones of our celebration uh, of our 75 years. And we, we think this book is really fun and we hope you'll enjoy it. And then here they are. Yes. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, we wanted to remind folks that we we're, we're actually are also just dropped into the chat, a link to an Edelweiss catalog um, with more information about uh, the work of our poets that you'll be hearing from today, as well as more information about the FSG Poetry Anthology coming in the fall. Um, so look forward to that. You are um, really in for a treat today. We are so delighted to have uh, Francine J. Harris, Balzina Mort, R Rowan Ricardo Phillips, and Hannah Sullivan joining us today. They are each going to give a reading. They've selected a piece of their own work and also a favorite poem um, by someone else that they'd like to share with us. So I'm gonna just read very brief bios uh, of them and then we'll launch into the reading portion of the program. So Francine J. Horace Harris is the author of four collections of poetry, including Play Dead, winner of the Lambda Literary and Audre Lorde Awards and a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. Originally from Detroit, she is an associate professor of English at the University of Houston. Her new collection, Here is the Sweet Hand, just recently won the 2021 NBCC Award in Poetry. Congratulations again, Hannah. Um, and then we will have okay. Valzina Mort. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's been a wonderful year for, for our poets. So it's, it's been so thrilling for us to be a part of, of, of all the accolades. Um, and after, Hannah, uh, after Francine, you'll be hearing from Valzina Mort, who's the author of three poetry collections. Her most recent, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, is shortlisted for the 2021 Griffin Poetry Prize. Her many honors include a Lannan Literary Fellowship for Poetry, and she's the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Grant in Translation Projects. Born in Minsk, uh, Belarus, she writes in both English and Belarusian. Rowan Ricardo Phillips is the author of three books of poems, including most recently Living Weapon, out from FSG in 2020, and two essay collections. His many awards include a Whiting Writers Award, the Penn Osterwell Award, the Annisfield Book Award, and the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. Hannah Sullivan teaches English at Oxford. She studied classics at Cambridge and then lived in the United States for a decade. Three Poems is her debut collection. It was awarded the 2018 T.S. Eliot Prize and the John Pollard Foundation International Poetry Prize. Um, and now I will turn it over to Francine J. Harris. Francine, I, I think you're you're still muted, unfortunately. Oh dear. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I said so many things. Hi, I'm Francine J. Harris, and I am reading um, a, a poem of mine from Here is the Sweet Hand, um, which is called Reflections in a Pool of Hair, and then a poem by uh, Margaret Danner. Reflections in a Pool of Hair. You have been standing in a pool of your own hair. You rub the hair into dirt and pick out crows you'd like to lift it away. You take off your socks, hand to eyes to block the sun. You look for someone who looks like you. You see men in retro glasses. You see men behind retro fitted glass and men on black bikes and women with small piercings in their sharp noses and you see their bad silver nail polish, you've got bad silver nail polish and everyone wheezes, you wheeze. And the small gay men at the bar spend sunset tuning American Idol onto two screens. They talk like bar glass. In their gravel, they vote singers. There is a tingle at the back of your throat that holds the phone on hold and thinks the words, Obama. Obama wants to be a palindrome. You catch yourself in a plate glass window. You catch yourself in the neighbor's glass plate. You catch yourself wondering if you look like your hair in their windows. They put away things as soon as you ask about them. Um, and this is a poem in some ways recently discovered because I've been thinking about Margaret Danner. 
Um, so this is called Sadie's Playhouse. Over the warts on the bumpy half plastered wall, just recently slapped with peach colored calcimine, Carter, the artist, curved tan mahogany chalk African women, tall and arched with a swaying grace. He then conjured nine green palm trees and three Egyptian perfume urns, so that those whom some might call flotsam, pimps, jadies, after tippling their cheap, heady drinks, could discern the palms, waving cool, green, shady, over the dancing now African ladies. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valjina Mort. Um, I'm very happy to be here with these three poets that I love. And um, I thank FSG for giving home to my obsessions. Um, and um, if in a few days we will mark the anniversary, the 35th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. Um, so I will read a poem that takes you to my Chernobyl childhood uh, that is filled with music and history. The poem begins as a dictionary. I'll try to show it with my, my voice as much as I can, but then it disintegrates into something else. Gamma rays. Cupid's arrow. A scissors bee keeps stuck into my thighs 30 kilometers from Minsk, sunstruck. The sun, Chernobyl radio station, broadcast its radiation is always on. The sun speaks into the tulips microphones. Microphones, Victor sits by the cow's udder like in a recording studio. Record, Yanina, blind, copies sheet music from my teacher's songbook, Beethoven death for accordion into my notebook. Xerox, unavailable in the empire, prize like a spaceship. Musical stuff, according to the music teacher, not Yanina's kitchen shelves, unacceptable to Rochelle but liberty to adjust music pitch like spices. Music teacher, a beautiful woman, furious like Beethoven's hair. Musical staff, according to Yanina. Rows of plank beds in the northern barracks. Notes are the bodies rounded and flattened by day's labor, either utterly dark or insanely empty inside. This is what makes music so poignant, so painful. Notes also, according to Janina, ladles. Beethoven, music should strike fire from the heart of man and bring tears from the eyes of woman. Janina to Beethoven, so music is a family brawl. Notes, according to the music teacher, ladles full of water Janina dumps onto Beethoven's fire. My heart on fire with fury every time the music teacher slams Janina's blind coping. I despise and secretly envy Beethoven for having nothing to do with plank beds in the northern barracks. A daily source of Beethoven, Chernobyl radio station, the joy of radioactive rains. My mission, I combat gamma rays with music octaves. Yanina tucks notes into the blank beds of music stuff. On one of them, she recognizes her old husband. Her blindness blurs all features into the ovals of notes. The cow chews rib grass but there is no cow. Birds shred the clouds with their dull beaks. The woods are thin like soup. Men live only on photographs. Alone, old women are 
old women. They lock in dentures, they log glasses onto hooked noses, they hook themselves into forklifting bras, secure kerchiefs with sailors' knots, and thus protected more thoroughly than first responders, they curse their hands and pigs as if they had hands and pigs. A rooster's call quick like a vaccine shot. The scissor's beak is as far as a cupid's arrow gets here. I fall in love with music she miscopies, music she syncopates, miscaring and miscoping without a peep. And uh, a poem written by somebody else is one from um, a Russian poet, Gennady Gor. Uh, he was a survivor of the siege of Leningrad, which lasted over two years and has a death toll of uh, about a million people. And uh, Mitzi was saying, uh, talking about uh, the fact that books matter and writers matter and writing matters. And so, um, this here's a little poem that uh, this man living under siege was writing amidst uh, great lack and fear and death. And the poem is um, kind of neither, neither heroic nor calling forth kind of sloppy empathy. Um, it is just weird and grotesque. It's very short. I ate Rebecca, the girl full of laughter. A raven looked down at my hideous dinner. A raven looked down at me like at boredom, at how slowly this human was eating that human. A raven looked down, but it was for nothing. I didn't throw it, that arm of Rebecca. Thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon. I'm Ron Ricardo Phillips. I'm really happy to be here with you now, especially with these three fabulous poets with the FSQ family, which uh, I love. And for all of you for your love, not just of books, but of poetry. Um, this gathering reminds me of the end of a, uh, a poem that's very uh, dear to my heart, but not the second poem I'm gonna read, Robert Hayden's uh, great poem for Frederick Douglass. It's an eponymous poem, the title is Frederick Douglass, but it ends not with statues rhetoric, not with legends and poems and reeds of bronze alone, but with the life grown out of his life, the lives fleshing out his dream of the beautiful needful thing. And this now very much feels like a beautiful and needful thing. So I give thanks. I'm gonna read a poem called even Homer nods, uh, even, even Homer nods, um, you can find in uh, Horace and Ars Poetica. And this poem I think situates uh, quite a bit of my temperament um, and some of my tendencies, which is to really um, be somewhat engaged in the past um, and the future simultaneously. Even Homer nods. You can be a mother who knows a God and you can ask him for magic armor, a shield the width of Saturn's widest rings, some helmet in the new or ancient style. Fill your arms with defenses for your child Take the peacock feather you've been offered and plant it in that helmet's crown or keep it for yourself to use as a pen. Note, this was the only option you were offered, stylist or witness. Witness 
with stylus so that you'd circle down the drain with death, mourning in either silence or sound bites, surrounded by silence and sound bites, life like this having been polished to shine in the normal way things shine these days. A dull lull, the type of insufficient glare we used to call out on sight as useless glow, but now in new darkness, we feel a need for a consolation of presence. As when my mother passed me the soft shield, the breastplate like rice paper, the helmet bright as pyrite can be. We already knew that this was part of the old cycle, that I would die soon and we do this again and again and again. Without ever knowing we were the weapons ourselves. Stronger than steel, story, and hydrogen. Here in America, where we wonder still after everything that's happened, why anyone bothers to read the classics. And uh, this poem by Seamus Heaney called Song, it has my name in it, which is one of the many reasons it's very important to me. Song. A rowan, like a lipstick girl. Between the by road and the main road, alder trees at a wet and dripping distance stand off among the rushes. There are the mud flowers of dialect and the immortelles of perfect pitch. And that moment when the bird sings very close to the music of what happens. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, video took a little while to come on. Um, thank you so much um, for inviting me to be part of this. It's really wonderful um, to read with the other poets. Um, to hear the, the readings has been great. Um, I'm going to um, read from the end of the third poem um, in my book, which has only three poems in it. Um, the poem is called The Sampit of Terrain, and it is about beginnings and endings, about um, my father's death and the birth of my first son. Forget the transplant your father waited for the middle of the night phone call that never came. Forget the parched brain fizzing with morphine, the body turning away in the bed bored. Forget the negligence of nurses. Start with a daughter looking for her father, waking in shuttered rooms in vandalized suites. Start with your father listening for his mother, waking in the action orphanage in wet sheets. Forget the children's sandpit after rain. Forget the pitch contour of rain. It flaps like leather soles on last year's slippers, muffles the sound of bin men lobbing rubbish. Start anywhere, everything dissipates. Wet brains batter the limousine at noon, end as a girl again, even as old, stranded in front of the fallen curtain, starting to sing. End with a happy birthday, last but one. You started dying on the morning you were made while your father soaked himself in the sink and your mother worked a porcelain handled knife into a simnel cake, sucking a marzipan ball. Crumbs flew like chaff behind the harvester. The letters of the coat flipped in their pairs, AA, TC, CG, CT, the odd proliferated error. Because this is what death is, grant me the patience.
start with a woman watching a man catching his daughter. End with a photo. End as a woman older than either, feeling her own child sag in her arms, seeing it all now for the first time after the ending. The sideboard with the touched up teak veneer, your mother's watchful shrug of hair and your own mouth slewed with laughter, feet tilted like a landing goose falling and your father's slender hands stretched out in the wind, henna stained, praying. In North Alt, the old front room, the photo with its reddish color cast, the faded figure in the catacomb scouring the ceiling. Watch contrajour, a shadow in the shade of the capish shell lamp, a mother and the child you were. You have been among the living twice and loved both times. You have fallen in the lurid air. Um, and as for a poem from someone else, um, this is from a FSG book, of course, um, from Robert Lowell's notebook, um, 1967 to 68. Um, it's from the, the sequence Long Summer, um, slightly enigmatic poem, I think a little bit less enigmatic, um, if you know that the, the first part is taken more or less um, straight from a poem by Mandelstam called Insomnia, which is about reading um, Homer a bit. But, um, and what I like about it is it conjures up, I think, a particular atmosphere as some are equally true in in Maine, uh, the Greek islands um, of a sort of um, lush, um, but also oppressive indolence. Two in the afternoon, the restlessness. Greek islands, Maine. I've counted the catalog of ships down half its length, the blistered canvas, the metal bowsprits, once pricking up above the Asian outworks like a wedge of geese, the migrant yachtsmen and the fleet in irons. The iron bell is rocking like a baby. The high tides turning on its back exhausted. The color dreaming silken spinnakers shove through the patches in the island pine as if vegetating millennia of lizards fed on fern and crop the treetops. Or nations of gazelles, straw chewers in the African siesta. I never thought scorn of things, struck fear in no man. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it was really wonderful. Thank you uh, to the poets. Uh, wonderful to hear you read. And I'd like, I'd now like to ask you a few questions. So I have a question for each of you. And I'm going to begin with Francine. Um, Francine, I have felt that the speakers of your poems are watchful, um, observant, hyper-observant, um, and also that they seem to contain multitudes. And mm. I wondered um, who are these speakers and, and how do your poems use characters? Hmm, that's a good question. Um... <laughs> Uh, you guys should know that we, 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 we I, didn't, I didn't know this question was coming. So <laughs> it was like a surprise question. That's a really good question, Mitzi. Um, and I think it's funny, you know how people say they don't think about audience. I don't know if I think about speaker as much maybe as I should think about speaker. Um, and I think it's because um, I'm a little suspicious of the persona poem. Um, there's a lot of persona poems that I've, I've loved um, and I've tried persona poems, um, but I find that when I, when I try to do, like when I set out and I tell myself that I'm about to do the persona poem, it, I feel, I don't know, disingenuous or insincere or something. So I don't, often think about speaker um, until later. Um, but it's, it's interesting because um, one of the things that I was thinking about in, in reading the Margaret Danner poem, um, who is um, part of the reason that I read her, and I, I didn't say this earlier um, in introducing her, um, is because I, I, I've been thinking a lot about subliminal mentors. You know, the people that you read that sort of settle in 
and you don't realize it until you read them later on and you think, oh gosh, there's so much there that I realized that I've um, incorporated in my own writing. Um, and I think her, her poems are very peopled um, and very, um, if, even if they're not necessarily persona, there's a lot of uh, characters moving through her poems and a lot of uh, community um, in her work. Um, kind of like Gwendolyn Brooks, you get to see a lot of the Chicago community in Danner's poems. So I definitely think that I do think about figures moving through and uh, characters in my poems, but I don't know if I um, exactly think about speaker, if that makes sense. It does, it makes me want to ask you more questions, but- um... Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about it later. <laughs> we can talk about it later. Uh, in the interest of time, I will move on yeah. to Valvina, who, who who I have a question for as well. Um, you were born in Belarus, um, and you write in both Belarusian and English. Um, and I wonder how that works for you. How how you do both? How you move from one to the other? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mitzi. You know, it might sound, it, it might come off so mysterious, this process, but it is actually not particularly mysterious. Um, I do not write, um, well, I do not uh, know a single language very well, right? I uh, write in English and Belarusian, and that's my second and third languages. I grew up speaking Russian and thought of myself as a Russian speaker. And later on, it turned out that it was, you know, a colonial language, an imposed language, a language that carried with it a lot of historical violence. And then I also met real Russian poets and Russian speakers, and they told me that what I spoke, what I thought was my Russian, was a kind of a pigeon and a kind of a not enough of a Russian. So here I am, you know, all three languages in which I operate daily, I do not quite, um, uh, you know, master them. I cannot claim them in any way. And I think that that's where, that's a place from, from where I start as a poet. I'm not looking to um, master the words on the page, but rather to set them free. And um, I do not, um, uh, I write in two languages because I write slowly. A poem for me always is very slow speech, even though when I recite often, I like to be theatrical and very fast. But um, when uh, I read for myself, it's very slow speech and slow speech needs to be written very slowly. So I move between drafts in between two languages, but also constantly thinking and questioning every word that I use and looking it up in the dictionary fully aware um, that both my English and Belarusian are imperfect. And that's kind of precisely why I write because poetry is not in the words, um, but rather in the intonation, in the rhythm. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the sound, the music, which carries meaning. Yeah, yeah, I can speak uh, more, but then I, t I tend to never stop speaking. So I'm being mindful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Valgina. Um, so Rowan, um, the poem you just read asks uh, why anyone bothers to read the classics. Um, I had a question for you, which is related to that, I think, which is about the fact that you're poetry does make use of mythology and um, spiritual traditions and you know, Orpheus, God, uh, poetic traditions as well, laments, sonnets, tercets, playful translations of Dante. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how you think about, poeti um, about uh, poetic traditions in, in your work. Ooh, I'm grateful that for that question. Well, I no, I, I mean, just... no, I love it. No, no, I, I, I actually, <laughs> I, 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 um, uh, you know, Wallace Stevens is a poet I come back to um, by temperament, by, by instinct, I think. And he has a poem called Of Modern Poetry, and it begins, um, 
the poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice. The poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice. Um, and I like the um, tenuousness of that statement. It sounds so definitive, um, you know, the poem of X, but the X is the mind in the act of doing something. It reminds me of um, the etymology of the word poetry itself coming from the ancient Greek poesis, which is not thing made or to make, but making, right? It's always this process. Um, and, you know, for that reason, I, I find that what we understand as poetic tradition is part of our process that's obviously part of our past, but certainly part of our future and not part of our future because it's some ever present hegemony, but rather because as time goes on, the, uh, we become more, um, as time goes on, we all become neighbors in literary tradition, right? There was a time when Shakespeare and Dunn were not contemporaries, but now most people don't, well, not most people, but <laughs> as time goes on, writers become closer and closer and closer together. Um, and I just, I write thinking that everything's on the table, that nothing has ossified. Um, and that keeps me, I think, kind of in the ecosystem that I want to be in as a poet, which is that um, nothing is closed. Um, everything is in discussion. I don't feel, for instance, when I'm translating Dante, that I'm translating a poet that's come um, before me. I feel like I'm translating a poet who will then come and find me after the fact. Um, we don't read. We have these neat anthologies from Norton and, and other places that give us a nice anthological, chronological sweep through the history of poetry, but we don't read in this way, right? So we may start reading a contemporary poet and then find ourselves in uh, the pre-Socratic era and then find ourselves reading through modernism. And my mind very much works in that way. Uh, you know, it's in the act of finding what will suffice. And I'm fascinated by literary tradition in, in part because it's always such a poignant um, reintroduction for me because literary tradition did not anticipate me at all, um, nor did it anticipate Francine, nor Valginia, nor Hannah. We, we come with kind of our ontological selves and kind of our, our nuttiness um, to a tradition that um, did not, it makes sense to think of Chaucer, I think it, may, it makes sense, right? To think Chaucer to Spencer, to Milton, to Wordsworth. Or it makes sense to think about the relationship that Keats had with Shakespeare. These things make sense, if you will. Um, but I'm very much interested in leaving um, in my wake whenever I go and the way things look, who knows when I'll go. Um, but a, a, a bit of a um, something off the beaten path, as, I, as Seamus Haney puts it in that poem song, something between the by road and the main road is the work that I'm doing. Um, and it's idiosyncratic, um, but it's heartfelt. And it's just another way of thinking about how we all come together and the pressure per, per square inch that um, both pushes us together and forces us apart. So it's, it's just an engagement in um, my idea of tradition, which is not something that is kind of obvious and ossified, but something that's living and, um, I guess in the process of making the music of what happens. Thank you so much, Rowan. Um, I now have a question for Hannah. Um, so um, three poems is transatlantic and it's set in New York, San Francisco and London. Um, so my questions for you are, how does American poetry um, look from London today? And how do you see your work talking to an American readership? Um, thank you, Mitzi. That's a, an interesting question, one that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently, because I suppose, like many of us, I've been leading a life that is, you know, resolutely and sort of rigidly provincial and domestic. Um, you know, barely imagine my work speaking to anybody outside my home, never mind, you know, outside the, the continent. Um, I guess um, it's a little difficult for me to say how 
um, this book has or would connect with an American audience because I haven't met American readers, you know, in American bookshops other than, at, you know, the one event that you were at in the way that I, I feel the English readers of the book are sort of visible and, and present to me in, in some ways. But um, certainly I think um, I've been influenced by the increased focus in a lot of American poetry on current events and politics and perhaps by, I mean, that was part of the attraction of the notebook poem that I read. I mean, the, the sort of oblique way in which the book handles kind of the years of 1967 to 68. But I think also by a more impassioned, and maybe more rhetorical um, style. Um, I, Donald Hall talked about the seedy grandiloquence of, of notebook. That's something that's definitely attractive to me. But I think there are a whole range of, you know, contemporary American poets who write with maybe more verve and more, um, rhetorical kind of aplomb than you know their British equivalents and that is something that I'm you know interested in in, in playing with I suppose at, at least um, but you know the recently I've been writing about um, the disaster at Grenfell the fire at Grenfell and a poem that is mostly set in my kitchen about lockdown um, so those I don't know whether the Grenfell fire is something that's a sufficiently um, sort of universal or transnational subject to you know, to appeal to or find readers in, in the US, but, you know, I, I hope so in time. Um. Well, it's certainly uh, about social justice. Um, mm. Yeah, it is. You yeah. know, it, we, we've seen lots of work um, yeah. in, that, in that vein here in, in the US. Um, we always have, though, I suppose. Um, so now I think Sheila, Yes, we have a few more um, questions from the audience. And actually one uh, lends itself, uh, Hannah, to something you were just talking about. Um, and all any questions that we ask are, are for anyone to take um, on the panel. So, um, but we, we've had a few people asking about writing process during the pandemic and lockdown um, and how has it changed or if so, um, so. Does anyone want to answer that? Um, I maybe I can say that for me, it's an <laughs> unbelievable nightmare because I got this really good routine going. I had a sabbatical before lockdown started, and after like two years of hardly writing anything that I was really satisfied with, I just kind of hit a vein, and then lockdown interrupted, dislodged me from the library where I was, you know, it's going every day to do the work, and obviously based me in my home with my with my kids. And I've never been able to write in my own home before. I've never tried to do that. I always enjoyed the sort of public space um, and creativity seemed to happen more easily to me there. So it's been a struggle. Uh, I'm sure many parents, you know, particularly with school closures, um, empathize with the um, lack, relative lack of, of time and the increased intensity sort of placed on, on any time that you get to yourself. Thank you, Hannah. Does anyone else want to add to that question? No? Okay, uh, Rowan, it looks like you um, are interested in answering the uh, exciting, uh, where where are you most excited to give a poetry reading when in-person events return? What is your dream event? Oh, just, you know, a poetry loving independent bookstore. Pick <laughs> one and I'd love to be there with people who are happy to be there, honestly. Um, you know, it's people that make the place um, but you know, you name an independent bookstore with a strong poetry section and, um, yeah, I would look forward to something, uh, like that. I guess it's more about the mise en scene than it, it is about, uh, me reading my, my work, but that's something I would really love to do. Um, also in response to the last question, I, I, I just have to say, I found that my process hasn't changed that much. It was incredibly mm -hmm. difficult to write. Uh, when the pandemic first hit for very obvious reasons. I mean, you know, the mind felt like concentrate stuck at the bottom of a jar and no one was around to shake it. Um, but I, uh, unlike, unlike Hannah, I actually, I, I love writing at home. Um, and I, I actually write um, largely in my head. I would say maybe 85% of the writing I first do is in my head. So, you know, I'm not fat and I'm not hooked on opium, but I've got a lot of Coleridge in me. And I really love to go for a long walk and just kind of like, well, the music of what happens. Um, so I, I found myself um, really engaged um, with writing. I've got myself, oh, I don't have them here. I was gonna show Hannah. I got myself a pair of killer like uh, noise canceling headphones and I wear them around the house without shame. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, so two questions answered for one. Thank you, Rowan. Belgina? Um, I didn't really love reading in theaters. Uh, I love being on the stage, but at this point, I think that I will not be picky at all. <laughs> and once the lockdown is over, I'm just gonna read everywhere and I'm gonna kiss and hug everybody who comes <laughs> to my reading. Um, so, and um, also go, going back to the first question, which is a very important question, um, I, um, for me, there's kind of no writing process, really. That's why I was hesitant to answer it at, at first. Uh, it, there's just life. And uh, like Rowan, I also write a lot in, in my head. And uh, I accumulate a lot, taking a lot of notes. And then once I get that space uh, that Hannah was talking about, uh, the space of just being alone and knowing that it's a space in time as well as a physical space then I just jump on it like a hungry dog on a bone and I do a lot of very intense uh, writing and um and yeah now um I got uh, yeah I got a six-month fellowship uh that will be announced soon and I'm looking forward to that because I have a lot of there are a lot of little things that I put away like a cheap monk you know and <laughs> I just need to get to it now. <laughs> well, I can say, you know, this 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 question feels like a nice uh, pitch to be invited someplace. So let me tell you, the places that I've lived <laughs> that I would love to go back to and haven't been invited back to yet: uh, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, uh, and Northern Michigan, uh, it, lakes Lakeside. Any of those places. Um, I really miss the water is what I'm trying to say. So it would be nice to, um, I'm looking forward to being able to go um, back by the water. Um, I'm kind of with Valgina on this um, writing thing. I, you know, oddly, I feel, I don't, maybe it's because I'm a little bit of a homebody anyway, but I don't think that my writing process has changed much from the pandemic. I'm just as sporadic, just as, uh, tend to, uh, likely to write it by revising, just as likely to, you know, scribble a poem inside somebody else's book. Um, uh, sometimes I write when I wake up <laughs> in the middle of the night because I can't sleep anymore. Um, sometimes I write in the mornings. Sometimes there's a long stretches of time I don't write at all. I'm just sort of, you know, consuming. I don't, I don't think that any of this has really changed much i tried to do the thing that everybody was doing it's like oh i'm gonna do a poem a day or a drawing a day or whatever a day and just, it just i don't know it didn't really nothing much has changed for me the only thing that changed um and i kind of want to say this because i, I want to give some other people um a, a a break from their guilt is that i got busier much much busier over the pandemic much more stressed out honestly, much more depressed. Um, it was very difficult time um, for me. So that that productivity, I just cast it off. I couldn't think about it. I couldn't deal with it. Um, but, you know, overall, I think I'm sort of feeling like uh, emerging actually has been productive. I've been writing more just si literally since I got vaccinated. Um, I feel <laughs> hope or something, so. <laughs> I just had, I actually would love to read a James Terrell's uh, Crater, The Roden Crater. That's some place I'd actually love to, to read someday. Okay, Roman, we're gonna make note of that too. Um, so I, I think we're at time. Um, I just wanna say thank you um, to all of our poets for being here today. This was incredible, really, really special. And um, also to all the booksellers, Macmillan employees, uh, media, anyone who um, came to our event this afternoon, we're really grateful. And then I'm going to give the screen back to Mitzi and Jonathan. And I also just wanna to say to everyone, I'm sorry for my 
a slow start, I got confused between uh, two different screens. So um, I won't I won't do that again if you if you join us again. So anyway, Mitzi, Jonathan. Um, I, I, I want to thank the poets, of course, um, and I want to thank the booksellers who do so much um, to support the writers we publish at FSG and to support the poets. Um, and it's been a very difficult year and few months and um, difficult for the booksellers too, of course. I can't see your faces. I know you're, you're there. Um, and we, we, we're grateful to you. And, and we've been thinking about that quite a lot in our 75th year as we've been um, celebrating what we do and pondering just how important it is to have the support that we have and for us to be able to support you as well. So um, those are the words I'd, I'd like to, to leave you with, um, Jonathan. I, I'd just like to thank everyone who participated in this and who came. And I think that you know, writing is a very solitary uh, occupation, but poetry has fosters a real sense of community that uh, you can see that in the, in the poets who are here today. Uh, we feel that it's a kind of familial uh, sense in the the poetry list that we have is a kind of family and uh, uh, as Mitzi says what what we have published in the past remains alive today and uh, it's an additive cumulative uh, practice and these new poets new new to our list relatively new are, are part of that family. And we're thrilled that you've been here to, to meet them. And I hope you'll get to know them better, both live and on the page in the times to come. And thank you for coming. Bye everybody. Bye-bye everyone, thank you. Bye. <laughs>